turnout tonight for a Sunday evening, and I want to thank you uh, for being here and commend you for your commitment to come out to hear the Word of God yet again. It's been my joy uh, to be here since, uh, I guess I landed on Monday, actually, and so um, I've made so many new friends, and uh, I, my life is enriched because of your fellowship and to be able to talk with so many of you. And I'll be going back tomorrow, uh, but I want you to know I will carry you in my heart and I will, uh, with fond memory, uh, reflect upon the time that I've had to be here with you. And so I wanna thank again, uh, Pastor Andrew Cordes for uh, his warm invitation to have me come and to be able to preach to you here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and it, it's such a joy, and I love this church already, and I've also met so many of you who attend other churches, and um, I just feel uh, a connection and a kindred spirit with so many of you. So what, what, what are you saying to me? I forgot to turn the microphone on, okay. You know, I miss that day in seminary when they uh, taught us how to do this, okay. No, I'll, I'll tell you, what, I preach in Dallas, Texas um, at Trinity Bible Church, and all the sound people know to hand this to me turned on, okay. <laughs> so I haven't turned one of these on in a long time, and uh, okay, so now, okay, I can even hear myself now. <laughs> okay, what a difference that makes. All right, so tonight we're going to be looking in Psalm 2, so I want to you to take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 2. The title of this message is, The World Gone Mad. And I want to begin by reading uh, the passage, Psalm 2, beginning in verse 1. And while you're turning to it, I, I really want to give you just a little bit of a background. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 really stand together like two gatekeepers as you enter into the book of Psalms. Uh, they were both placed here strategically by the compilers of the book of Psalms. Um, Psalm 3 through Psalm 41 are all written by David, and Psalm 1 and 2 are what we call orphan Psalms. Um, anonymous, however, in the book of Acts, uh, Peter assigns Psalm 2 to the authorship of David. So, I want to begin by, by reading this psalm. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my King upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that He not become angry, and you perish in the way. For His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. 
In these verses, we see a world gone mad. We see all social structure in complete upheaval, and beneath it all, it is all a revolt against God. That the whole world is in upheaval because of their spiritual anarchy against God. Society is in an uproar against all moral restraint from God. And the culture is in chaos. And the nations are teetering. What was once unthinkable is now unhindered. The sin that used to slink down the back alley now struts down Main Street. The government has far exceeded its limits. The wickedness of man is pushing out the boundaries to now things that Paul says are unlawful to even speak about in public. All moral restraint is gone. The world is in a free fall with no end in sight except the lake of fire. This is precisely the world scene that it is described in Psalm 2. Here is the total depravity of the human race that is shaking its fist in the face of God and is in revolt against Almighty God. Here is the moral law of God being discarded and man choosing to go his own way. And here are the world rulers leading their people against the authority of the Word of God. This is true of every generation of human history. And it was especially true the generation in the day of Christ that rose up and crucified the Lord Jesus Christ and committed premeditated first-degree murder against the second person of the Trinity the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will escalate and it will build. And in the last days before the return of Christ, all hell will break loose here upon this earth. And so this scene that is described in Psalm 2, it is true of every generation. It is true of every continent. It is true of every nation. And we see it going on all around us. Apart from this psalm, there is no making sense of the world today. We are seeing Psalm 2 literally unfolding before our very eyes. And so as we walk through this psalm tonight, this is a dose of reality. This is the divine interpretation of the world seen that we see unfolding before our very eyes tonight, and it will go from bad to worse. Apart from some dramatic divine intervention, which God in His grace might step in, but otherwise, this world will continue to unravel like a cheap sweater. And so, as we look at this psalm, I want you to note in the first stanza, first, the insurrection against God. The insurrection against God. The psalmist begins by asking a series of probing questions. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why is the United States of America in an uproar? Why is Australia in an uproar? Why is China? Why is England? Why are the nations, all of the nations, in in an uproar? And the uproar here pictures a, a state of unrest, of instability, of stormy, chaotic conditions. Why are the nations raging like a turbulent storm on a sea? And then the, and the peoples, 
devising a vain thing? Why are the citizens of these nations scheming and plotting and conspiring a vain thing which is futile, is destined to fail, is doomed for destruction, is marked by insanity. Why have the people of this world gone mad? Verse 2, the kings of the earth, the president of the United States, the prime ministers of the nations, the kings of the earth, take their stand. They set their jaw. They defiantly oppose the moral law of God. They dig in their heels and they set their jaw against God and the rulers, the political leaders, the financial leaders, the corporate leaders. They're all in it together. There is a conspiracy. It is a satanic conspiracy. As they meet in G7, as they gather world leaders around the world without actually a a written agenda, yet it is written in their hearts to rebel against God. And the rulers take counsel together. They forge an unholy alliance to overturn the moral law of God, to redefine the family, to redefine marriage, to redefine parents' rights to discipline their children, to redefine when life begins, to redefine gender. And this is what they say. Verse 3, let us tear their fetters apart. What they're saying is we do not want to be tied down by, by the law of God. We refuse to live by God's standard of morality. And let us cast away their cords from us. They want to be free from God. They want, they want to be liberated. They want to choose their own gender. They want to marry their own gender. They want to abort their own babies. It is a total, complete, global, comprehensive repudiation of God's rule over a person's life in favor of them doing what they want to do, how they want to do it. This is the world in which we live tonight. I believe that this is what we see all around us this very hour. Here is the rebellion of this present generation to throw off the fetters that would tie them down. This is the anarchy of this present day. This is the upheaval that we see. And there is no political solution to a spiritual problem. There is no legislative solution to a spiritual problem. This is the insurrection against God. And to have any other view of the world scene tonight is to be like an ostrich and hide your head in the, in the dirt and pretend like this is not happening tonight. And it will only escalate. And it will only grow and be enlarged 
as one sin pushes the boundaries out further and further and further and further until what was once unimaginable becomes standard living on this earth. I want you to note, second, the indignation of God. In response to man's arrogant boasting, God now speaks for the first time in this psalm. And what God has to say is absolutely terrifying. Verse 4 begins, He, referring to God the Father, who sits in the heavens, He is enthroned in the heavens. He is ruling and He is reigning. The throne is occupied, it is not vacant. As He is presiding over the kings of this world, presiding over the rulers of this world, sitting in supreme authority over the peoples and over the nations of this world. He who sits in the heavens laughs. It's not the laughter of humor. It's not the laughter of hilarity or joviality. It is the laughter of mockery and the laughter of disdain and the laughter of derision at the absolute insanity of rebelling against God. That all of the nations of the world together would think that they can overturn what God has established and what God has built into this world. And then in verse 4, the psalmist says, the Lord scoffs at them. The Lord here, Adonai in the Hebrew, means the sovereign one, the ruler over heaven and earth and over hell itself, the potentate of the universe, the king of glory, the crowned head who holds the whole world in the palm of his hand, the holy one who rules and reigns, the Lord scoffs at them. He mocks them at their Lilliputian attempts to overturn His world, as if looking over the battlements of heaven and peering down into this world, you puny little man would alter my design for the family, my design for gender, my design for marriage, you little fleck of dust. The Lord scoffs at them tonight. God is not a stoic sovereign. He is repulsed. Isaiah puts it in right perspective in Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales, all of the nations together. Behold, He lifts up the islands like fine dust. He he lifts up Australia, this massive continent, like it's a fleck of dust. Verse 17, all the nations are as nothing before Him. They are regarded by Him as less than nothing and meaningless. Verse 21, do you not know That implies you should know this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is He who sits above the circle of the earth. 
and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they, referring to these world rulers, been planted. Scarcely have they been sown. Scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but He merely blows on them, and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble, like blowing on a dandelion. God says, to whom then will you liken me, that I would be His equal, says the Holy One. This is an alarming psalm. This is an encouraging psalm. Verse 5, then... He, referring to God, will speak to them. God now speaks, and laughter turns to fury, and scoffing turns to speaking, and they will now be addressed as they have never been addressed before. He will speak to them in His anger. The word for anger here literally in the Hebrew means the nostrils or the flaring of the nostrils, and the idea is the heavy breathing of God, (sighs) the escalating anger of God against the rebellion of this planet. It is a warlike passion where God is with heated vengeance and filled with righteous indignation, is ready to strike and smite the nations. He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury. He will put them in dread when He speaks. They will be filled with horror when He speaks. Because He will speak to them in red-hot fury, with kindled anger and boiling, seething wrath, saying, this is what God will say to them now, verse 6, but as for me, in stark contrast to the anarchy of the nations, But as for me, I, God the Father, have installed my King, God the Son. He is now already enthroned at the right hand of the majesty on high, and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Father has enthroned His Son as King. He is king over all the kings of this earth. He is judge over all the judges of this earth. I have installed my king upon Zion, referring to the heavenly Zion, my holy mountain, high and lifted up and exalted, the most high, towering over the landscape of this world, and regardless of what defiant peoples of the earth may conspire, the eternal decree of God moves forward unchanged and unaltered. Man proposes, but God disposes. As Stephen Charnock writes, to be God and sovereign are inseparable. 
This world is not run by a democracy. It is run by a theocracy. It is not being run by majority vote. It is being run by the rule of one. In heaven, there are no debates, there are no caucuses, there are no primaries, there are no delegate votes, just God. So look at verse 7, and I want you to see third, the instruction of God. The speaker now changes from God the Father to God the Son. And this is what the Son says as He recalls and recounts what the Father has said to Him, a conversation of which we would never know otherwise. This is an intertrinitarian conversation. Verse 7, I, referring to God the Son, will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. I will now restate what is the eternal decree and the eternal purpose of God the Father and what He said to me. He said to me, the Father said to me, verse 7, you are my Son. Today I have begotten you. And this begotting refers to the incarnation the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coronation of the Son of God at the right hand of God the Father. And verse 8 now, this is, a, this is specifically what the Father spoke to the Son. Ask of me. The Father says to the Son, ask of me. And I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. These nations that are in an uproar, these nations that are in rebellion, these, these nations and these rulers, just ask me. And I will transfer them all over to your sovereign hands. And the very ends of the earth as your possession... And the ends of the earth is a comprehensive term to understand every nation on this globe will be given into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ for Him to do something to them. And verse 9 is the command of the Father to the Son, and the Son will be obedient to the Father. This is what the Father commanded the Son, verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. The Father charges the Son to judge and destroy and damn these defiant nations. A rod of iron is a scepter of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. You shall break them into a thousand pieces. You shall utterly destroy them. You shall devastate them. You shall crush them. You shall smite them. And you shall consign them to the lake of fire and brimstone. And this looks ahead to the final judgment at the end of time, and the imagery is one of taking a piece of earthen pottery that is fragile and frail and literally smashing it into dust. This is the Father's command to the Son, enough of this insanity. It has gone too far. And the Father has already destroyed the entire world's population in Genesis 6 and 7 with a global flood and just wiped out the entire human race, including the animals, children, babies, wives, 
Husbands, the entire population of the planet, God drowned them to death, except one family of eight members. And it's Sodom and Gomorrah, as they flaunted their their pride, their gay pride, God rained down fire and brimstone and burnt them to a crisp. Holy God. Hebrews 10 verse 30 says, God says, vengeance is mine. There's no delegating this out to the angels. God will first person smite them. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God who is a consuming fire. We need to understand who God is. We need to know God for who He is. And God is intolerant of the sin of sinners. And God is intolerant of sinners. And so this leads finally to verse 10. The invitation of God. The speaker yet changes again, and the psalmist speaks on behalf of God. And there is a ray of grace that shines into the darkness of this scene. There is a moment of grace. It's like when Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And there was a a brief period that Nineveh could turn to God and, and repent before the heavy hand of God's crushing judgment comes down hard upon the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And they repented, and God held back His judgment. And here there is, as though the veil is pulled back ever so slightly, and there is a ray of of hope, a a ray of grace that just shines through ever so slightly. It's like when Jonathan Edwards preached, sinners in the hands of an angry God. He said, there's there's a door that's opened, and Christ is standing in the door, and He is calling to sinners to come to Him before it's too late. That's what verses 10 through 12 is. It's the invitation of the gospel. It's the extension of grace. It is the offer of forgiveness. But you must act quickly, and you must act now, and not presume that the Lord will hold back the flood tides of wrath any longer. So, verse 10, now, therefore, And great preaching always gets to the therefore. And great preaching always has a sense of urgency about the moment now. O kings, you who have flaunted the law of God, you who have desecrated 
the law of God. And you kings and you judges who have used your influence over the peoples of your nations and you have set a course of direction contrary to the holiness of God. Oh, kings, show discernment. Wise up. You're insanity. You are drunk with your own sin. Show discernment. You cannot continue and meet this God in judgment and escape. Show discernment. Take warning. Oh, judges of the earth, you judges are soon to be judged. You judges are going to be put in the scales and weighed against the holiness of God, and you will be found wanting. You have been summoned, and you have been subpoenaed to appear in the supreme court of heaven and earth, and your day in trial before God is just around the corner. It is coming. You have an unbreakable appointment with God. Prepare to meet the living God. So, verse 11, it's your only hope. It's your your only way out. Worship the Lord in reverence. Fall down on your face and humble yourself and give God the glory. Submit to Him surrender to Him, settle out of court, treasure God with reverence, with fear and trembling, because He holds your eternal destiny in His hands, and He will do with you as He pleases. And there will be no mercy in the day of judgment. There will be no forgiveness. There will be no second chance. There will be no grace. So much sin, so much judgment, and some places in hell will be hotter than other places. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice. Rejoice that this invitation is being extended to you, but as you rejoice, do so with trembling. Realize that your eternal destiny lies in His hands. No one giggles into the kingdom of God. We all come under a heart wound of deep conviction of sin and trembling. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, verse 12, it's an imperative command. The gospel is more than an offer. It is an offer, but it's more than an offer. It is an imperative command. We are commanded to repent We are commanded to believe in God's Son. It is an invitation, and it is a free offer, but it is more than that. And here's the command. Do homage to the Son. As the King James, the authorized version says, kiss the Son. There's no way to appease the wrath of the Father if you do not kiss the Son. And to kiss the Son draws from the imagery of the ancient world when kings would be defeated and they would be dragged back into the conquering nation and be brought into the inner throne room 
where the victorious king sits upon his throne. His throne would be elevated and lifted up, and the conquered kings would come before the throne looking up, and there would be a footstool, and the conquered kings must kneel down and kiss the feet of the triumphant king. And this is the invitation that is being extended to the kings of the earth, especially in this hour and especially in the last days, that you must humble yourself and deny yourself and fall on your face and lower yourself and, as it were, kiss the feet of the Son of God who was crucified upon Calvary's cross, was buried and raised on the third day, who is now ascended to the right hand of God the Father, you bow down and kiss His feet. There's no easy believism here. There's no cheap grace here. You must strip yourself of all arrogance and pride and confess your sin of rebellion against Almighty God. Do homage to the Son. Surrender your life to Him. And here is why. That He not become angry. For His wrath may soon be kindled. His wrath is beginning to boil and to brew, and it's like Jonathan Edwards said in that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that the wrath of God is flowing like a river, and it is ready to consume sinners, but it is being held back by the dam of God's mercy. But the longer that sinners prolong and procrastinate coming to faith in Christ and this river of wrath continues to flow and held back by the dam of His mercy, that the, that the river of wrath is just building and it's building in its force and in its strength. And one day when the dam is pulled back, the built-up wrath of God will literally sweep sinners into the very bowels of hell. Where, Christ him, where God Himself will inflict the punishment. Kiss the Son now while there's time. Let He not become angry for His wrath is now smoldering and it may soon be kindled to such an intensity that you will never recover. And so, this psalm ends at the end of verse 12, exactly as Psalm 1 verse 1 began. It's a literary device known as inclusio or inclusion. It's like brackets around Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. They stand together. And Psalm 1 says there's only two roads of life. There's the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And Psalm 2 now says what will happen to those who are on the way of the wicked. But this is the final invitation that God extends grace for a limited amount of time. And even God will not continue to cast pearls before swine. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. It's your only hope. It's your only deliverance. 
at your only rescue. How blessed, how graced, how forgiven, how favored, how pardoned, how reconciled, how redeemed are all who take refuge in Him. It calls for a de decisive act of faith. It calls for a decisive act of entrusting one's life to this installed and enthroned King. It calls for kissing the feet of the Son in lowly submission and humble repentance. But you must take refuge in Him, the Son. There is salvation in no other name. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. You must take refuge in the one who was sent from heaven, the Son of God, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless and perfect life, who obeyed the very law that you have thrown off again and again and again. He has fulfilled all righteousness. This one, the Son of God, who went to the cross, and there He was lifted up, the Son of God, the Son of Man, lifted up upon the cross to be crucified by men, yet it was according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. He was the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, that for all who would come to the Son, there is an atonement for sin. There is the expiation of sin and the taking away of sin, and there is the propitiation of the wrath of God upon sinners. The Father's wrath can be appeased, it, it can be satisfied, it can be placated if you would just come and kiss the Son and embrace Him by faith. In a moment, in a moment, the warfare with God will be over. In, in a moment, you would have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment, you would be reconciled to Him and in a favored position. But you must take refuge in Him. You must believe upon Him entirely, exclusively, solely. It is the only salvation that is being offered to you. Regardless of the insanity that is going on in the world tonight, Let me speak to you personally. Have you shown discernment? Have you heeded this warning? Have you surrendered your life to this enthroned King? Have you kissed the feet of the Son? Have you taken refuge in the Lord's anointed? If not, do so now. Do so quickly. For his anger will soon be kindled. And there will be no mercy in the grave. There will be no mercy in the judgment. But today, tonight, is an hour of grace that is extended to you. It is being extended around the world through gospel preachers, through evangelists, through teachers, through parents to their children, 
But the hour is growing late. And we are approaching perhaps the very end of human history as we know it. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man shall return. And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the trumpet of God and the voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That could happen tonight. That could happen at any moment. Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. Like a thief in the night, unannounced, breaking into this world to take what is valuable, his bride, and take her out of this world. And then all hell will break loose. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. If you've never committed your life to Christ, do so this very moment. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. He who hardens his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come to Christ, throw yourself upon his mercy, kiss his feet, and you will find full, free forgiveness of all of your sins. And you will escape the day of his burning anger. While love, while grace, while pardon is offered to you, believe upon him tonight. Father, thank you for extending the offer of the gospel, even in the darkest hour of history. Thank you for this psalm that speaks so strongly to describe the world.